Um, some, uh, some of us we know, okay, of Frederick Douglass, 1800s, the guy was a major abolitionist, okay? The slave movement, former slave, and here's his story. He escapes from his slavery, and he's able to do so much toward ending the slave movement. But one of the things he had done in his autobiography was tell a story, and it was about his mom. And it's just perfect for today. So I want to read little snippets out of what he had to say. It was just all about the love of mommy. Okay, listen to this. He goes, my mother and I were separated when I was but an infant. He says, before I knew her as my mother, I was taken away. Because it was custom now in the 1800s, some of you remember this, um, in Maryland, <laughs> for kids to be separated from their, from their moms at a very early age and then taken somewhere else. So this happened to Douglas. He says, my mom was hired by a Mr. Stewart who lived about 12 miles away from my home. Nonetheless, my mom found ways to see me. And he says, she made her journeys to me at night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand. And whipping was the penalty for not being in the field by sunrise. She was, she was with me in the night, he said. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep. But long before I had awakened, she was gone. So he was speaking of the incredible love of his mom for him as a child because she did work in the scorching heat of the tobacco fields from sunrise to sunset. And then he said, with her body crying out for rest, she walked 12 miles in the dark to go see her son. She would comfort him and hold him and, and put him to sleep. And then she would have to walk another 12 miles back, giving up a night of sleep. She definitely risked, she had always risked a severe whipping because that's what slaves would get if they were discovered to have left. Yet, nothing would keep her from me. Indeed, this is the love of a mom for her child. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? It's so interesting, you guys, that I can say this as well. The story of a mom's love for a child extends to Paul for the church. Do you remember that from previous study? How he had ascribed the passion of his love for the church to this mommy characteristic in him. That that's, that's, how, he, that's how he described it in verse eight. He said, being affectionately desirous of you. And that was the character of a mom's love. He goes, you had become very dear to us. I mean, how, how amazing is such a love? And you know, as Christians, even to you men, I can speak it this way. We, we can be in, endowed with that kind of love by the God of heaven. Now, in this morning's message, what we see is that man with such passionate love for his, can we call the Christians in Thessalonica his kids? And yet he was separated, not 12 miles, but 800 miles. He was in Corinth there in Thessalonica. And he has the same kind of, you know, that desperation, that love that just, it's so, it's, it, it, all, it aches in his body. He talks about how, yeah, he's 800 miles away, but what else? Oh, so many are coming against him. He's talking about Satan being a part of what's coming against him. He's talking about this. With you guys not, with you guys not having me there, are you going to suffer? Because moms, 
let's face it, even until we're in retirement age or whatever, you know, if you're still around, you still think that we're going to fall without you, which is true for just about all of us. But that's what Paul was saying to them. Are you guys going to fall? How do I know what's going to happen to you? And it has been one year since he last saw the Thessalonican Christians. Here's where the Lord then leads us to our study for this morning, okay? The word struggle seem to have, you know, come to the forefront. Because the way Paul writes this, he's blunt, man. He, he says, I, I'm struggling. Like this is desperation struggle in my heart. And for the rest of chapter two and chapter three, you guys, here's what he does. Here is how you have victory over such struggle as this. How applicable for you and me. Okay, all right, so you haven't been separated like Paul has from them um, or Frederick Douglass from his mom, but whatever, whatever it is for you, you might say, yeah, Raj, I could stand up there and I could tell you a struggle story. Whatever it might be, here you go. Okay, this is, this is what I call Paul's victory over struggles and it is applicable, three points applicable for you and me every single day and in every single struggle. So here's what we would do, okay? I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and then well, let's go for it. Let's let the Lord just minister to us on this beautiful Mother's Day, okay? God, thank you for another opportunity to, to, where we got to sing and praise and worship just heart to heart with you. Lord, now it is a time of being fed, of growing in, your amazing word. And we pray, Lord, that you would anoint this time that we have together. God, that every heart here, you would fill us afresh, speak to us. Lord, we wanna walk from here having grown in you. Lord, even more on fire, even more passionate in our faith in you. And Lord, if you've brought anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, we lift them up to you. We pray today would be the day of their salvation. We pray in faith together in Jesus' name. Amen. So in your first notes, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the elements right off the top, and then we'll sort of fill in the blanks as we go. Okay, that's why number one has three blanks. Let's just fill them in right now. Three elements we're going to learn to deal with struggle. They're all starting with L. That was my alliteration for today. Loving people. Loving words. And limitless prayer. Loving people, loving words, and limitless prayer. By the way, for the loving people, it's going to be Timothy. All right, I'm gonna say Timothy a lot today. So in case you wanna just mark that there. Um, loving words, it's gonna to refer to Timothy's report back to Paul. So again, we're sticking Timothy in there. And then of course, limitless prayer is self-explanatory. Look what verse 17 says. Here's Paul going, but since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Okay, here's the deal. What Paul wants them to know is how desperate, like how much a struggle my separation is from you. And how do you know? Okay, you see that word desire there, a great desire? In the Bible, almost always, it's used for lust. Lust, like negative connotation of lust. But in this case, he turns the, the word's meaning. He, he seizes on the passion component of lust because in lust is a passion. The problem is it's to satisfy the flesh. Now he goes, I have just as strong a passion, but this is a godly desire. Man, I want to connect with you brothers and sisters and share the love of Jesus. So look how he, desire, how he describes it. I lust, I long, it's so much. And then he uses another term there. He says, torn away. Um, a poor 
Orphanizo. Orphan is a word there which we get from torn away. Orphan means uh, describe somebody who has been separated from someone they love involuntarily and they will never be able to rejoin. And we use the term orphan to describe kids who have unexpectedly lost parents, who have been pulled away from parents. So what does he do in describing his desperation? He equates it to the passion of lust and to the state of orphanhood. So is he struggling? Yeah, yeah, he's struggling. You guys, the Lord, he wants us to relate. I mean, okay, you're not lusting in that sense or orphan in that sense, but whatever you might be going through, God gets it. Okay, you describe it. You say, Rod, you don't understand how much. And I'll say, okay, maybe I don't, but the Lord does. And so he wants to minister to you very personally. So here's how. So I hope just knowing that Paul is struggling that much is an encouragement to you and to me. So what else does he do? We're still going and defining struggle. Verse 18, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Ugh. Satan hates God, and therefore Satan hates the people of God, especially those of God who do God's work. You get it? It's the whole God thing. So yeah, he's actively trying to hinder you. You ever noticed that before? You're like, where did this come from? How is it that I couldn't proceed here? Uh, that hinder, the word hinder, it's the best reference that I think I know is literally referring to two runners in a race. And one wants the gold medal so bad, they will cheat. What they will do, hinder means they will cut off. They will physically cut into the path of the other runner so as to cause one of two things. Either stop them or make them stumble off the track. Either way, it's a bad thing. And Paul says, that's what I'm facing against this devil. He's doing that to me. I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. You guys might be doing what you need to do. You're coming to church. You're growing in the Bible. You're, you're giving money. You're volunteering. It's all for the Lord. That's what you would say, and that's true. And then Satan will cut you off one way or another. Something will just happen. For Paul, if you remember in 2 Corinthians 12, he calls it his thorn in the flesh. He says it's a messenger of Satan. We don't know exactly what that means, but we know that that is the case. He says, I got cut, man. I got cut off by Satan. And this is just the way it's going to be. But let me ask you a question here. Um, Paul writes in his ministry that he's also hindered by God. He writes that, for example, he goes to Asia. He's taking the gospel. He's taking, planting the church northward to Asia. And he says, the spirit hindered me. So are you serious? So, you know, a common question. Roger, I mean, you know, to one another. How do I know? Who do I attribute this hindrance to? How do I know that being stopped here is because God did it or Satan did it? And sometimes people just throw those around. Oh, this one was Satan. Oh, that one was God. Well, how do we know? I think the answer is the word hindsight. Okay? And sometimes we don't like to hear that. But the answer would there be hindsight. And the measure would be this. Did it end up advancing the gospel? Or did it end up hindering the gospel? But no matter what, and this is why I want you to write this, no matter what, ultimately, just know that God is in control. So write that part down. Nevertheless... Paul was going to Asia, and you know what Paul was doing? He was going to tell people about Jesus. He was going to tell them, you know, you're a sinner and you need to be saved, and God has a way for you to be saved. Hey, that's good stuff. But suddenly, God himself stops him. He turns, and he goes to a place called Macedonia. 
But you know what happens in Macedonia? Churches get rebuilt. People get saved. So you think he could uh, attribute that hindrance to God? I would say so. Okay, but in this case, or let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 2. He knew that the gospel wasn't being furthered by his being where he was. In fact, it was this. There were people knocking at the front door of the church. Remember, I've used that, that um, image before. And these people don't believe in Jesus. So what they're trying to do is interrupt, you know, their, their growth in Jesus. They're trying to say things like, Paul is a charlatan. You know, don't listen. He's a fake. He's a fraud. They're trying to take advantage of you. Things are coming down on the Thessalonian church here pretty soon. And since Paul knows it, he wants to go and like step up, but he can't. And so he's able to say, therefore, I'm being hindered, but this hindrance is by the devil. Okay, so hindsight is the answer to your question. How do I know? And then the condition is further or, or stopping the spread of the gospel. All right, so you guys, let's continue forward. Now, right now, I want you to skip verses 19 and 20 because we're actually gonna close with the principles, it's so cool, the principles that he teaches us in 19 and 20. So like, you're like reading 19 and 20 as I'm telling you not to. Isn't that something human? Like when we're told not to, we do it anyway. Don't go to chapter three, verse one, okay? Don't do it. Do it. Chapter three, verse one. All right. So he says this. Um, it's, it, here is the, what I call the first element of his struggle that needs to be dealt with. Okay, so what did we just do? We established that he's struggling. Then we're going to get into the specifics of the struggle. Got it. So number one, therefore, he says in verse one, when we could no longer endure it. Just stop there for a sec. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it. Do you guys, do some of you, um, remember Popeye the Sailor Man? Remember that? Those of you from the 1800s, you would remember <laughs> Popeye the Sailor Man. But, but Popeye the Sailor Man, so Brutus, the bad guy, you know, like he will be beating on Popeye or, or doing something to olive oil. And finally, there comes a point where Popeye just can't take it anymore. And so what'll he do? He'll be like, that's all I can stands. I can't stands no more. And he grabs a thing of, spinach out of his shirt and bam, pops it right in his mouth. You know, his muscles turn into sledgehammers and then he just pounds Brutus and it's like, yeah, all done. <laughs> okay, a little extreme, but <laughs> this is Paul saying, that's all I can stands and I can't stands no more. And so his can of spinach is Timothy. Remember I told you guys, right, Timothy? He's a big deal here, you guys. Here's what I'm going to teach you. Here's what the Bible teaches us. You and I have to be Timothys and we have to have Timothys in our lives. Check this out. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Just right there. In the gospel of Christ. Look. Paul and those guys, they got rioted out of Thessalonica. Man, they, the rioters, they wanted his head. And so he gets driven out. He goes to Berea. Then what does he do? He turns and he goes to um, Athens. And Athens has been two or three months. And he's like, I miss my, my church. So even after just two and a half, three months, he sends Timothy back to the church. So listen, there's a difference. Paul writes this letter one year after the riot, but he had sent Timothy three months after the riot. So finally he gets word of all that has gone on in the church. So you understand there's a struggle. I sent him nine months ago and I'm finally getting him back. So Paul is like all stressed out and he goes, nevertheless, now here's the key, you guys, nevertheless, I realized something. 
I realized you needed someone. Someone to go and minister to you because you guys have a struggle. And I realized that in your struggle, somebody of the Lord, and look what he calls Paul, um, Timothy. Timothy's like 20. Timothy's like 21 or some young dude. And he says, brother, co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul's is like in his, a lot older. He's a lot more mature. He has been ordained of God himself to be an apostle. And yet he says, by the way, I'm sending you this man that I consider an equal. And off Timothy goes. Here, let's do it this way. Let's consider that in your struggles, check this out. One way to deal with them is by dealing with other people's struggles. In other words, we take our eyes off of ourselves. I know, and sometimes we go, yeah, but my problem is that big. Well, we already demonstrated what Paul's problem was. That was big. And when we have to have victory over struggles, here's what, in essence, you're being like. Listen to this. You're being like God. Tell you why. Because he saw the struggles of humanity, the biggest struggle of all. They were all damned because they were all sinners. We all sinners. The Bible says that what? The consequence of sin is death. Nah, the death doesn't mean you just stop living. Death means that you and the Spirit, you're continuing, but it means an eternal separation from God. And it means that to be in hell forever. Remember, I've told you this before, hell wasn't designed for rebellious people. It was designed really for Satan and the angels with him. It was designed for rebellion. And people weren't supposed to be a part of that party, but they are. So God sees the struggle down there. And you know what he does? <laughs> no, Timothy. You're talking the son of God. And he sends him to go and deal with the struggles of humanity. You understand? That's what you're seeing here. This is, this is heaven being played out. You guys, when you consider the struggles of others and you respond to him, I want you to know what God sees. God sees you being like him. God, God rewards, God blesses those who imitate him. These are the things that bring joy to the heart of the Lord. See, God is always greater than our struggles, isn't he? We say he's greater than our struggles because we use that in a healing sense. No matter how much I struggle, God's joy, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness is greater, so he's going to wash me clean. Yes, but God is also greater in the sense that I better value, um, how do I say it, like, like self-therapy to try to get myself out of the struggle. I better value it less than what I value God and what he deserves. So it's almost like going both ways. He's greater than your struggle. Man, power from heaven. He's greater than your struggle. Lord, I'm, I'm gonna do what I can for your sake and not expect anything done for my sake. Okay, do we get what Paul just did? That's what he does. He goes, I was suffering. Things were bad. And I sent the one guy who was my equal. I sent the one guy where they probably sat down together and prayed and talked about the day. Do you remember that one guy? I tried to tell him about Jesus and he almost punched me. You know, they had that kind of fellowship. I think. That's, that's in my gospel in there anyway. But they must have talked. And he still says it. I, uh, it, I, hope, it's, I hope it's inspiring in the midst of your struggle. I hope what God is doing in all of us is in times of struggle, make sure your eyes don't turn inward. Make sure they stay outward. Now, when, let me go on because the concept is going to stay through the rest, through most of our study. But let's go on here in verse three. Look, we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co worker in the gospel of Christ. Now, here comes the intention to establish and exhort you in your faith to make you more honorable to God. It's always a God thing. If I'm going to send 
the person I love to you, the reason I'm doing it is so that you can be drawn into greater fellowship with the Lord, so that you can be drawn to become more like the Lord. If it's just to make you feel better because they have, you know, the right words to say, you know, it, you'll be okay, you know, you'll be good, and that's where they leave it, we have to second, we have to think about it. We have to consider it because there's a purpose. Paul needed Timothy. There's a purpose. When you see, again, you guys, God being glorified, when you see people becoming more like God, you say, man, that's, that's the green light. Here he goes, we want to, we want to establish. By the way, establish means to make straight, okay? Make straight. The doctrines of God, whatever it is that they might be having issues with, just to make them straight, to get them to understand what it is. To exhort in your faith means to, in essence, have you go do it with authority or have you go do it with expectation. Pastors, shepherds are called to exhort the flock. So when I stand up here and I tell you, you got to do something or not do something, I get to expect that you're going to do it or not do it because the Lord has placed me in that position. But family, husbands and wives, parents with kids, others, you know, you have a calling to exhortation as well. Use it. Guys, when we get exhorted, don't take it offensively. I mean, if they're sharing it, if they're doing it in love, humble yourself. Okay, I see the Lord using you to, to um, encourage and establish and exhort me. You know, you could even just say, could you help me? Could I, could I ask you to kind of keep me accountable? Could I ask you to pray with me maybe every week? Let's connect. This is what has come of all that's going on with Paul so far. It's, it's, really, it's really, I hope, inspiring. That's the way it goes. God bless you. All right. Um, let me get you, I, I want to, let me, let me explain number three, because this one just sort of, it came and I want us to remember that it's, it's the, it's one of the, the exclusive high points and truths and power of Christianity itself. What I, what I want you to see there is the word incarnational. You're, you're doing Christian ministry when you either give a Timothy out or you receive a Timothy in. And this is where it goes to. The Christian ministry is always incarnational ministry. Check it out. Visible, touchable, personal. Remember what we said in the beginning? God saw a struggle from heaven. And so what does he do? He sends his son, his son incarnate who puts on flesh and blood, who came, who became a man, who became a servant of all, and then died on the cross. This is an incarnational faith, Christianity is. It differs from every other faith because there, no other faith can say God himself became one of us so that we could touch him, so that he could relate to us so that he could go through every problem and every trouble and every issue and we could see that he could defeat it. It's not theory. It's not just doctrine. It's not something you have to hear about. No, this was personally witnessed. This is an incarnational faith. Hebrews 10 verse 5. It, God is spirit, but it goes, this is Jesus. A body have you prepared for me. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know that Christianity is still incarnational? Do you know how it's still incarnational? Because we are the body. Christ the body, now church the body. Do you know how, how important, how valuable you are to God? You're like his son. When you go and live out your Christian walk, when you face struggles, but they see you facing a struggle in a completely different way than the rest of this world does, you guys, they're seeing the Lord. They're seeing somebody who has something and inside of their human frailty, 
They say, this is the only way I can be brought to strength. This is the only way I can be brought out of my struggle. What do you got? Because I want it. And that's when you get to say, <laughs> I got Jesus. Like, like, I got Jesus. He's my power. And if you have him, you will experience the same thing. You guys, we're incarnational ministry. You, you and I got to go out there and remember, we are the body of the living God. Oh, um, uh, uh, Paul, uh, God speaks to the people through tablets on a mountain. Remember that? And it's, I want you to read it in this way the next time you read the story of who Jesus is. God was so compassionate and so personally like, like, like connected. So, you know, so, um, so much, of, well, I can't think of the word. Um, so affectionate for his people that he wanted to bond with them in a way that said, we can never, this bond will never be torn from one another. Stone tablets shatter on the ground. Jesus didn't. Jesus died on a cross, but you know what happened three days later? He rose from the dead. And he says, that's what you got right now. That's how you and I are connected. So when you read the tablet story and the cross story, I, I, I want you to be thinking that way. Just watch what it does, how God just lifts you up. So if we're supposed to do that, with one another, with, with uh, incarnational ministry, finally is this, the ministry of God's people to one another, okay? So far, I've been talking about mostly the ministry of God to the other, to the people out there or far away. I'm talking about you, the person next to you, the person wherever that you actually get to be involved with. Um, it, the exhortation, you guys, is you gotta be in that circumstance, you got to be in that situation where God will use you in incarnational ministry. That's why, to me, it just seems like the life group ministry is the place for it, where you have your groups of 7, 8, 10, 15, I don't know, whatever it is. You got to understand something right there. God is making you Timothy to them, and he's making them Timothy to you. And the depth of, you know, the influence that you guys can have on each other, well, a lot of you already know, like, yeah. My life is changed because of this group of eight. If you're not in some ministry like that or that very ministry, um, I believe you are allowing a void in your life that God never wanted to see. You're allowing an emptiness that God always had the filling for. This is the way Christians are supposed to think about relationship. This is the way Christians are supposed to think about personal ministry. If you think about it with that depth, instead of a, ah, oh, it's a Friday night. Let's see if I can get there or not. Am I hungry? Should I do it this way? <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you see what God has made those? I want you to consider those. And if you're not in one of those groups, I want you to be convicted. Because remember, conviction is a holy and godly thing, okay? Not a condemning thing. But I want you to consider your decision. Is your decision filtered through this, this truth? Or is it filtered through this truth? Because one ain't the other. And it's got to be this one. All right, so incarnational ministry, it's a Christian thing. It's a Christian experience. Let's go live it. Now it goes like, we got to move on here. Um, that no, one be <laughs> that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for his. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. <laughs> moved. Sayeno. You know what it refers to? It refers to the wagging of the dog's tail. It refers to this going back and forth. Um, Norman, our dog follows Missy everywhere, like everywhere. If I need to know where Missy is in the house, here's all I need to listen for. If it's on the door in the bedroom, I'm like, oh, Missy's in the bedroom. 
If it's on the, kit, the refrigerator in the kitchen, you know, it's like, oh, Missy's cooking or something. This is how I know. But Paul uses that in a very negative context. What does that mean? You're flip-flopping in your faith. At one moment, you're going to be one way. At another moment, you're going to be another way. We call that building on sandy, uh, you know, on, on the sandy ground. Um, being rocked back and forth by every wind of doctrine. And Paul says, if you want to know how to lose in a struggle, don't be set on your faith. If you want to know how to lose in a struggle, stay relatively ignorant of God's word. If you want to know how to continue suffering in a struggle, kind of keep on the surface. And here's what will happen when those, when those guys come knocking on your door and telling you that what you believe isn't real. You'll go, really? Are you sure? But, but my pastor told me it is true. And you'll come back and they'll say, no, 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 wait a minute. Just consider the evidence. I mean, evolution has been proven absolutely true. Really? Are you serious? Yeah, and, and, and morality, it's, it's best relative. What's good for you is good for you, and what's good for me is good for me. And then it flips even more. And then you read the Bible, and the Bible says, no, 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 wait a minute. God is the source of morality, therefore morality is absolute. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens. And Paul says, if that's the way you're going to take life, then yeah, you're going to be like Norman's tail. You know, <laughs> you're going to be hitting doors and fridges and stuff, but it's not going to feel good. The other one about this, though, was to you guys. I hope this brings you comfort, please. The word appointed. Okay, you're appointed. You know, this is, this is afflictions, but they were, they were um, set before you. You were destined for this. When, when you experience struggle in your life, if you truly are staying true to the word, remember, staying on track, staying on course, then you should know that your afflictions are something of the Lord designed for you to grow you, to strengthen you, to refine you, to give you some new character or perspective that'll be benefit, beneficial for me or beneficial for your friend or beneficial for your life group or something like that. And these are why we're supposed to take affliction. Actually, it's so weird to say this, but Christians can, to suffer your affliction in joy. Because there's a depth, isn't there? There's a depth. It's not superficial. Not happiness. You don't have to laugh and smile and say, woohoo. But still, there's a depth, and that's called joy. Because you know that God is in control. Right? Everybody's, we all have the appointment of, uh, of affliction. <laughs> I bet on your calendar, it might say doctor's appointment or office or school or something. I bet none of you have affliction <laughs> written on any one of those days. Nevertheless, it is appointed, as Paul says. What does he say to Timothy, his young son, but his co-worker in 2 Timothy 3.12? Indeed, son, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Everyone. Jesus even says in Matthew 16, in the world, you will have tribulation. But then he also says, oh, don't worry about that because I have overcome the world. I think that's one of your life group discussions. Yeah, I did. I have you guys talking about it. So be ready. Um, so are you ready? <laughs> Not ready for the discussion, but are you ready to live a life steeped in joy of the Lord, even though you face affliction after affliction? Ah, Christian, be able to say yes. Pray, okay? We're not gonna be unrealistic about this. Something tragic happens to you. You're gonna cry and you probably will cry up to heaven and say, Lord, why? You'll ask, you'll question. Hey, that's where we are right now. But you have a power beyond you, and I have a power beyond me. Seize the power. Now, let me not go so deep. Just your coworkers, if they're a bummer to work with, or just something's going on in your marriage, or something's going on in a relationship. Okay, I want you to seize that fact. Seize that truth. Right? You've got the ministry of God to you. And so we're supposed to carry it out, understanding its affliction, and then to carry it out in the joy of the Lord. 
Remember that alone is supposed to influence others, right? The way you receive and the way you respond. They notice that and it changes them. So that, that's still now a Timothy. I still want us to keep the Timothy on because that's who he was. Watch what comes, watch what comes next. He says in verse five, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So there's the wagging part that those guys would tell you, no, don't believe it. And this would be something that the devil would be doing to really try to turn you away from the things of Christ. Um, but he uses a term here, fear. And I simply want to point out this. You guys, here's what I wrote down. Through the fog of, of fear, God looks different, life looks different, pain looks different, commitment looks different, and circumstances look different. Did you hear that? Through the fog of fear, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have him lift the fog. Let that be your first prayer. Lord, take me from this fear, and God will remind you, fear is not of me. And then he'll empower you. He'll strengthen you in that truth. And then you move forward with your life and your commitment and your affliction and your circumstances. Um, that's why you need a Timothy, too, in your life. You know what Timothys in our lives do? They help lift the fog. Paul, uh, Timothy's going to go to the Thessalonians, and he's going to learn that they were just, hey, come on, I'm Tim Timothy, what? And the Holy Spirit's going to use this Timothy to kind of go, you know, and the fog just lifts. And then they respond. In fact, that's what he's going to get. Real soon, he's going to get that report. It's right here um, going on to verse 6. Look, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, oh, as we long to see you. Remember what I said? The next one was loving words. You guys, words come in lots of different variations, in different combinations. But what they're supposed to do ultimately is edify the other in the things of God. Did you hear that? Loving words should always have this effect, to edify one in the things of God. That's why you can speak truths and sometimes the truths are harsh because you're going to speak it in a loving way. You're going to say it in a way that really demonstrates Jesus. And you know what that's going to do? It's going to edify them in the things of God. Now, if they, in the flesh, they're going to be like, hey, who do you think you are? But that's sin. Loving words. You could even write there edifying words. That's a good word to, to stick in there too. Well, Paul goes, Timothy brings them back. And I know that you're strong in your faith. Fear didn't overcome you. You stuck up for me. Like, yeah, way to go. And, and so he goes on, verse seven, look. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and afflictions, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. See what he said? I was struggling so bad, I almost feel like I felt like I was dying. But he goes, now I live because I know your state. I know your position. Um, the, love of, the love of a Christian is supposed to be where we bear the burden of the other, right? It's supposed to affect us. And so when we pray together and we consider God together, we get to say, ah, oh, now I live because the Lord has overtaken you, because your faith has been multiplied, because we just saw a miracle happen. You just got the report back and, you know, it's, it's gone. This is for now we live, for now we rejoice, for now we're happy, for now things are good. And I also got my Timothy back. These are, these are the good things. You guys, that's the way it works in the relationship of, of Christian people. You, you want to get over struggles? Man, relationship counts. Hmm? You need Timothy. I need Timothy. You need to be Timothy, and I need to be Timothy. And all of these come our way. Let's continue, please, forward. Verses, verse 9. Okay, now it said prayer. Remember? It, uh, um, limitless prayer. So we got... We got, the, we got the, um, the loving people, we got the loving words, and now we go to number three, which is limitless prayer. 
For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Here comes verse 10. As we pray most earnestly night and day. Tell me in struggle, would you agree that prayer is probably uh, the go-to thing? The high priority thing? I would say so, seeing as, let's see, Jesus was about to die on a cross. And what he does is he goes to a garden and he prays three times. So yeah, that's our, that's our model. You pray night and day. I love those of you, you tell me how you've got your, journal, your prayer journals and you'll say something like, and I got this list of names. I just, and even some people say, hey, do you have a name that I can write down in my list because I want to pray for them every day? That is so awesome. That's just the coolest thing, you guys. That's the way we're supposed to be. Prayer for Christians. Prayer by Christians. When they're struggling, prayer. Uh, you know, Gospel for Asia, that organization, they go into particularly third world countries there in Asia. And the um, founder there, uh, K.P. Yohannan, I found this quote that I thought, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. He goes, I often talk to people who have been beaten and tortured for their faith. They don't want sympathy or praise or even a way out of the difficult situation. They all have the same request. Please pray for me. Got it. And he's talking about thousands of people, by the way, who are suffering affliction and struggle because of their faith. Okay, so they prayed and prayed. Verse 10. That we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. This is interesting. Paul is not condemning them or criticizing them. Here's where he's being a parent. Here's where he's being a pastor. Per, per, parental love and pastoral love come together in this phrase. Supply what is lacking in your faith. Okay? Well, I should say parental love comes, we may see you face to face. And then pastoral love comes, that we may supply what is lacking in your faith. These are sort of the elements of a Christian's character. You got to be pastoral in that you care about my faith. You care to help me grow in my faith. I care to help you grow in your faith. But all along, you should feel my love like a dad, which is to particularly exhort you, you know, guide you along that. And then the love of a mom to nurture you, to protect you like a mommy who has her arms around her little baby. Those are the three components. Isn't that so cool? He just puts it right there in verse 10. Finally, in these last three verses now, model prayer. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Hey, even though Satan's a hindrance, God's in control. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. We're always supposed to pray for increase. Did you know that? Give me more. But you don't necessarily say, give me more money. <laughs> give me more time off. Give me more stuff. No, our increase is love. Our increase, oh, abound. Oh, Lord, may I abound in love, two targets, you and them, one another and all. Two targets, pray it. Lord, may I increase and abound in my love for, I'll lift you up by name or the people of the church. And Lord, may I lift up and abound, I mean, grow and abound in my love for others. Missy, had some, Missy and I had some really interesting experiences when we went overseas a couple of weeks ago. I, she and I would both concur on something, and that's this. God gave us a different kind of tenderness for those people. We just acted differently with them. And I can tell you without a doubt, it's because God answered this prayer. It was like, um, what is the word? Contextual. It was like an abounding of love in the context of Britain versus an abounding of love, you know, in the context of Walmart. 
I don't know where that example came. I just pointed that. Lowe's, uh, Safeway. And that's what God will do. Pray in my circumstance right now, in my work, in my house, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my trial. May I increase and abound in love, okay? That's a key part of prayer. 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends by speaking about the second coming of Christ. You know why? Because Paul says it like this. It doesn't even matter your situation. Seriously, if your struggle never is resolved, and I put that in quotes, resolved, <laughs> you know what's coming? Victory in Jesus. Man, he's going to take care of everything. He's going to make every wrong right. He's going to persecute every persecutor. He's going to destroy every destroyer. And that's supposed to make us go, then I'm living it up. Then I am living it up. Then even in my struggles, I am committed to living it up. That's what Paul will say over and over again. You guys, live it up. No tail wagon. Live it up because Jesus is coming back. I sent Timothy to you, but still my focus was on Jesus coming back. You sent Timothy to me, but still my focus was on Jesus coming back. Okay, so that's, that's we just got to leave that there. That's good enough in that area. Jesus is coming back. That builds you up in your faith. Okay. I told you I was going to close with 19 and 20. Okay, now I give you permission to read 19 and 20. <laughs> yeah, I know, like half of you have already read it. Here's what it says. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Huh? And you guys, just a reminder, verse 9 of 3 for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? Here comes a key word. For all the joy that we feel for your sake before God. Paul uses joy and rejoice five times to describe his relationship with them. What do you think? Uh, those relationships you have with other people in the church? Could people look at you and say, ah, joy? Or would they say, ah, yikes? <laughs> You want joy, man. He's rejoicing because there is a connection. You guys, when we get over struggles, it's because we get connected. He's like, you guys are my joy. I rejoice in you and everything is cool. Now, I, I must say, there is a more particular context. Okay, let me, let me give you a deeper context to what he's saying here. He goes, in truth, you guys are my joy, but that joy is actually going to come in heaven, when we are, when I see you standing around the throne of heaven and you're worshiping our Lord, you guys, I don't need a reward. You are my reward. He goes, I'm so joy filled because I know that's where we're going to get. That, that's all I need to see. I just need to see you guys standing around the, the throne. And I, and I, I'm so thankful. You guys, I want to see you standing around the throne. I want to go to heaven and I want to see you standing there and you're worshiping Jesus and we recognize each other. And, I, and, and here comes a question is, what about you? How does God use you? You know, in your life as a Christian, would you be able to say, I can't wait to see you around the throne of heaven? In other words, because of your service to the Lord, sharing the gospel uh, being an example of Jesus, would they respond to you by saying, I want him? And then you'll be able to say, oh, joy of joys. I can't wait to see you at the throne. Or would it be empty if just your people were there? I think, I think it has to become so, so, such a motivator. I don't think we think about it this way. I think Paul just gave me the right to because it's not conceited. It's not prideful. He goes, you're with Jesus. And I got to be a part of you being with Jesus. And my joy, man, in you is full. Look at, look at life. Uh, here's what I put for your final note. You do that when you live life with an eternal perspective. 
Don't you agree? When, when you think eternally, not temporally, you're looking at the throne. You're looking at the population surrounding the throne. And you even get to discern, hey, I know that guy. I, ah, your joy gets multiplied. Hey, I know her. Hey, wait a minute. We prayed together. I recognize that voice because somebody called the church and they needed prayer. And so I got to pray with her. And this is where Paul says, you guys are my joy and my rejoicing. Would you, would you, would you act? Would you act in it? Okay, you guys, that is a component of struggle gone. You are there for the benefit of others. That is a component of joy multiplied. When you get to be used by God to win others to the kingdom of God. How sweet that is. Okay, so we got it. This is our victory over struggles. I want to encourage you in your life groups. You guys, you got some good questions to pray about and talk about. Do it. Do it good and deep, you know. But here's how I would ask you. Because I did it. Make sure when you talk with your group, you can say, because I did it. Or I'm gonna do it. Okay, that's that thing. Now, here's what I would like us to do is close, please. Let's uh, close our eyes.